2023 has been another action-packed year. This week, we'll take a look at some of our favorite photographs and how we captured them. And we'll talk about the best gear of 2023. Before we get started, I just want to say a big thank you to Camera Canada for sponsoring this episode. If you guys are in the market for a new camera, maybe you got some cash for Christmas, <laughs> head on over to Camera Canada and they will take care of you. And make sure to watch till the end to find out who won the $150 Lenscout gift card. So Jan, it's 2024. You're one day ahead of me over there in Australia. How is the year going so far? Or exactly, maybe not how it's going so far, but how's the last few weeks been? I saw you've been on the road, saw some really cool, um, looked like a really fun shoot with some turns along the coast there. What have you been up to and how's it going? Well, I actually come just back from shooting those turns yesterday again. So in the new year, I've already taken 15,000 photos. I've only gone <laughs> through about half of them it's always an annoying task to go through such a large amount of photos but if you had a colony where there's constant actions like birds flying in birds feeding birds babies sticking their heads out the parents feeding the babies it's like non-stop you don't even know what to shoot and you just end up basically firing away non-stop but that was definitely a very cool spot and lots of different opportunities yeah, it looked like a fantastic place to test out that new Canon 200 to 800 and do some flight shooting. How, how, I know you've done some review videos on the lens, but like, how has the shoot been going? And have you had any challenges shooting with that new lens or how do you like it? Well, this actually surprised me a lot in this case because I was mainly using it with the 1.4 extender attached, hmm. which kind of gave me the perfect focal length, right? 280 to 1120 millimeters. So I was actually able to zoom out if a turn was coming close to me mid-air or banking and at the same time mm -hmm. I could also quickly zoom in all the way to a mum feeding the little baby or hugging it with the wing or something so in this case I felt like this new lens was basically made for this occasion because I couldn't think of any other lens that would have done better there because you use a prime lens you're clipping all the wings you're too close to oh, the yeah. baby wings go up like you just can't get anything basically and this lens was very good and it worked surprisingly well with the teleconverter attached as well. You're wide open at f13, which is not ideal, obviously, but bright ocean, bright sort of sunlight. It wasn't really an issue. And the autofocus also tracked it really well. So I got some really cool action shots and seagulls attacking the turns and turns banking and they're all bringing in the fish. So it was a spectacular few days and I definitely put the lens through the test and it has actually more impressed me than at the start. It's really growing on me. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, I think it's going to depend contextually what you're shooting and where you're shooting. So that lens, I've watched a few yours and don't, don't be uh, mad at me. I cheated a little bit and I watched some other people's reviews as well. But, you know, because it's a lens that is interesting to me as well. I haven't, I haven't bought one yet, but you know, I see a lot of people shooting in fairly wide open areas and sort of everyone, of course, is talking about the aperture, the F9 or and and, and a lot of people also talking about whether the 100 to 500 with a 1.4, how does that compare? It looks like a really fun lens. I won't be surprised at all if I wind up with one at some point, but there's just certain limitations. You know, I was thinking about my recent shoot and times when F9 would have been OK in the darker rainforest, the clouds forest, and just not something that I would look really that kindly to use. I think I'd be pushing you just living at ISO 12,800 and things like that, which wouldn't be great. But it certainly looks like an awesome lens for a lot of things. And you think about, you were talking about using the 1.4 converter. I was thinking about if Canon comes out with an R7 II, that's a little bit more where I'd like it to be. That's such a deadly focal focal range there where then yeah. you don't need the converter and you have essentially even more focal length than you just talked about. So it could be really fun moving forwards uh, into the future. And I've used it in a couple dark spots as well when I was photographing the pink robin, for instance, and even there it performed pretty well. Of course, at some point F9 becomes a little bit limiting, but overall it's been really good. So the thing that really stands out the most to me about the 200 to 800 millimeter lens is really the ability to get to 800 millimeters without using a teleconverter. That's basically unheard of. I can't think of any other lens where you can actually do that, basically. And also I think it puts the 100 to 500 
back into the place where it belongs. Like it's basically the best 100 to 400 millimeter lens that has an extra 100 millimeters. But it was kind of punching above its weight with using the teleconverters trying to jump in another category that it wasn't really made for. Whereas now you can basically have the 100 to 500, you use that without teleconverters, get amazing image quality, super fast autofocus. And then you can also use the 200 to 800 millimeter lens on the long end, giving you that massive reach. So you have really a perfect one two punch, basically. So here's, here's my problem or my like what I think of there is, so I'm just packing to go on another trip and yeah. um, there's no way that I would bring my 600, the 200, 800 and the 100 to 500. There's no way. No. So, and I'd rather right, right now for most of my shooting, I'd rather have the 600 and the 100 to 500. So while the 200 to 800 looks very appealing and I could see a lot of use cases for it, I could also see myself packing and every time that one's going to get left out. You know what I mean? Now, it would happen because of the size and because of the lens foot, lens foot that doesn't come yeah. off. It's kind of hard to travel with. I was thinking the same thing. If I'm going to fly to Cape York, I have to take my 600 millimeter prime lens. And then because of the size and the ability to still use the teleconverters, the 100 to 500 probably makes more sense for travel than the 200 to 800. But if you don't have a big prime lens, for instance, it's basically it. a no-brainer. If you have a Sigma or Tamron lens, you get now a lighter lens with more focal lengths, better image stabilization, and better autofocus. You can basically sum it up by saying, if you don't have a super telephoto lens, this lens is a no-brainer. Totally. And I know while I was on a trip, you've also been on a trip. You've been away in Argentina for a few weeks. What was the main reason to actually go there? Was there certain birds? You just want to enjoy the sunshine, escape Canadian winter? <laughs> yeah, be a snowbird. No, no, there was definitely target birds there. Actually, I've been wanting to go to Argentina for several years. I was actually planning to go in 2020 in the fall, and obviously that got derailed and hadn't been able to kind of reboot that trip until now. And I'm kind of glad that, that it did take a little bit longer to go because back then there wasn't even really a field guide. Now there was a nice field guide to get you all excited about the birds you're going to see. <laughs> There's a lot of newer stuff. Stuff and certain ecosystems that I really wanted to visit, like the Chaco. The Chaco is sort of a type of forest that's all largely mostly in Argentina. And there's a ton of birds, uh, especially a lot of warbling finches and different finches, some nice hummingbirds, some really amazing stuff. Um, and that was really exciting to visit. And I did a bit of stuff up in the high Andes, visited the Ibera Marshes, which is a big wetland ecosystem that has a bunch of cool seed eaters and things like that. And then also Argentina has some really good, another forest type called Yungas, which is kind of like a type of cloud forest that's just sort of in Peru and Bolivia and Argentina. And so those different ecosystems provided some amazing opportunities to get some great shots of birds that I had sort of seen in the field guides of other countries, but never had a good opportunity to photograph. So it was a fantastic trip. Yeah, you sent me the link to your gallery on your website and I was amazed at the amount of species you got and actually also the amount of folders you managed to edit in such a short period of time. Like, I think I'm a fast editor, but I could maybe edit one third of those photos in that amount of time. So what's your secret sauce there? <laughs> Well, for one thing, it helped that I was jet lagged and I was on a crazy time difference. Not a crazy, but five hours. I was waking up every morning at two in the morning and basically working <laughs> through the day. So I was I was putting in some hours at the computer, but I, I really pride myself on kind of my efficient workflow. I always just throw all my images that I'm going to keep from a trip into DxO, run them all through there in one batch and always process a bunch of raw photos at once. So I'll open sort of, you know, 50 photos at a time. I have a preset set up that will automatically start with our pro sets applied. I usually use the vibrant more contrast one and that gives me a great starting point so I've already kind of jumped ahead a few steps in the raw processing then if let's say for example I kept three photos of a bird in sort of the same setting I'll edit the one using our pro set get it looking good and then I'll grab the other two and I'll sync the settings and I'll see if those two also look really good and if they do then I just convert them all into TIFFs and move on to the next ones so it's those little things you know they don't necessarily save you so much time each one, but even if you save 30 seconds on every file and you edit 150 files, then that's really, you actually saved yourself two and a half hours just there. And if you find five tips that save you 30 seconds each one, then all of a sudden you've saved a ton of time. So it's those little tips and those little efficiencies that really add up when you're processing a whole bunch of images. But it was an awesome trip, but not much time to uh, celebrate because I'm off again on Wednesday, which is two days from now, uh, for seven weeks of guiding in the Andes in Colombia and Ecuador. You really must hate being home, hey? Well, snowbirds, you know us Canadians, we do try to get away from the winter. <laughs> 
So before we leave 2023 completely behind us, what was like one of your sort of favorite moment and favorite trip or favorite experience or maybe favorite learning experience in 2023? Mm. Yeah, those are good questions. Well, let's break them down. Let's start with let's start with favorite photo. Now, there may be some recency bias here from my <laughs> recent trip because it's actually hard to remember. I mean, it's hard to remember all the way back. But I think Glenn, I started the year. Glenn, to be honest, our favorite photo is always the next photo we take, isn't it? If we are fully honest. <laughs> There, there is that too. I mean, it's it's actually crazy. I got back from these trips and already I'm already planning, you know, the next trip. But I have to say, and I'm going to tell why this photo is is my favorite. So many years ago, 10 years ago, I was in Bolivia and I saw this amazing hummingbird, the red-tailed comet. It's, it's to this day still one of my favorite hummingbird species. And I saw this bird, I got some really good shots of it, some very good shots. I'm very happy with the photos I got of it, um, feeding and everything like that. But what was really you know, stuck in my mind. I saw another male come over and the one that I was watching flew at this other one and flared its tail out. It has a long red tail, it flared its tail out. I was like, oh my God, that was amazing just to see. But it was impossible to capture a photo of it. I, I just had to, you know, go away with the memory of that. So flash forward to last month and I was in Argentina and in the certain area that I was, the comets were reasonably common. I was coming across individuals, you know, not, they're not super, super common, but I was, I was finding certainly more than I was in Bolivia. And I noticed that one of the males was really territorial and I decided to just kind of camp out on that, that bird for a whole morning shoot. And I managed to capture the bird flaring out his tail and flying around these flowers. So I was so happy just to, just to sort of see that thing happen and then years later to actually be able to capture a photo. Now, would I have been able to capture that image with the 7D 10 years ago? Absolutely not. So while it took a long time to get it, it, it needed to take that long for the camera gear to get better and for my skills to get better. So for me, that was my favorite shot of last year. And it's interesting how certain photos stick with us in our head or sometimes we go out and we have a certain photo in mind like you had for this trip basically you wanted to get this photo and you already saw it in your head for so many years before you could actually take it and I think that's what happens to yeah. me a lot as well I see a certain bird do something or I just like I've never photographed a palm cockatoo for instance but I know exactly what kind of photo I would like to take of it so now I just want to go there and actually kind of make that dream a reality and I think that's a sort of fascinating aspect of what we do or that sort of hunt and thrill and not only just getting a bird but yeah. also getting the bird the way we envisioned about getting it and we've talked about this before on the show is that i think what sometimes sets really good photographers apart whether it's birds or whatever you take pictures of is visualizing the type of image you want to take not just reacting and going out and snapping pictures but actually visualizing the type of image that you want to create and then figuring out how to get there so that was something i was really proud to get that shot but what about you Ian? you've had some great shots this year what was some of your favorites from 2023 well i had a similar moment very recently where a friend of mine showed me this turquoise parrot nest, how they were just breeding in this little stump in like a flowery field. And for years, I always thought it would be so cool to get a shot where all the babies come out of the nest. Because just a few, maybe two or three days before they fledge and leave the nest, they will climb basically up to the top of the nest every time the parents come and they almost feed them out in the open. So there's these four babies sticking the heads out and the mum is feeding them. So that was a special moment for me and one that I wanted to capture for many years. So that was definitely cool and I also had another bird that might be my favorite photo of the year you asked me before what's your favorite photo of the year it's actually very hard for me to pick because there was so many interesting ones but recently and I'm going to make a full in the field video about this as well I found these fruit doves near my house on the sunshine coast and that was another bird I wanted to photograph for so long because down here in, like in Asia and that sort of Pacific region there's all these totally mind-blowing like fruit doves we know doves but then you throw the dove in a paint bucket and then you glue a rainbow on it and then it's even more colorful than that. So it's crazy colors. And I was able to capture and film and photograph some of these stuffs and that was definitely another sort of special moment. Yeah, those ones are amazing. So those were some great shots, but what was your favorite overall sort of trip or, or experience that you had in 2023? Definitely my favorite trip of the year after I recovered from another sort of mid-year slump was when I was driving with a friend of mine to the Mount Isa region. Big road trip all the way through outback Queensland down into South Australia as well. And the amazing thing on this trip was that 
basically everything we tried to do worked out. We were basically mm. going somewhere, getting the birds whenever we arrived within like two hours. And then it's like we planned maybe to stay somewhere for two or three days trying to get these birds. You get them in the first afternoon. So the whole trip was basically like, oh, yeah. let's go there. Let's go there. Let's add this bird to the list. Let's add that bird to the list. And wherever we would go, we would find the birds. Like there's some really rare and hard to bird, get birds like these carpentering grass wrens. They only live in this tiny area, very secretive sort of birds. We managed to get them pretty easy. I got some nice, very lorikeets I thought we wouldn't get, but we're driving into this campground. And normally they're really high up in the tree, but then they're, they're right at eye level. Found a nest of the birds at eye level as well. So it was a wild trip with amazing photos. And then there was one bird that was definitely a highlight was when we were just on these open gibber plains in South Australia. And I always wanted to see these inland dotterels, like these shorebirds that just live in the middle of the outback in like scorching heat. They just run over these rocks. So it's pretty amazing just the habitat they live in. But then we also found this group that had a few little babies with them. And I managed to get like the mum with two babies sort of just on a tiny little yeah, hill in the shot. outback. So that was a definitely very special moment. Yeah, that trip looked super productive. I remember you telling me, and, and and sometimes that happens. You know, a lot of times you 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 know you get some good ones, you miss some stuff, but every once in a while you have a trip where you know the stars align <laughs> and you get everything works out. So that's awesome. I know it's always very hard for new camera gear to make its way into your bag, but I think this year you had one new addition. So how did you go with it? How do you find it so far? Yeah, I, you know, I, I do make my decisions on equipment pretty, pretty specifically, but it was a no brainer to buy the 100 to 500, especially after hearing you raving about it so much. And I did need a second sort of telephoto zoom lens because my wife has commandeered my 100 to 400. <laughs> so I realized that I need, I needed a new middle, middle of the road telephoto lens. And I'm so happy to have that lens. I had tried it on one of my clients had it on one of my tours I was leading. And right away, I noticed how much better the image stabilization was than the 100 to 400. Yeah. And it's nice and light and it gives you the extra 100 millimeters, which is really nice. So yeah, the 100 to 500 isn't going anywhere anytime soon from my camera backpack. So yeah, really happy to have that now. And I don't have any kind of purchases on the horizon, anything else that's out there at the moment, but, um, but uh, definitely happy to have that one. I know now you've been trying so much equipment, so much more equipment from <laughs> Canon and Sony and Nikon and everybody. What about you? You've tried a lot of stuff this year. Anything, any real standouts? I definitely had a big year. It started off with, I think I tried the R6 Mark II. That really blew me away because it had the amazing autofocus, probably the best you can get at the moment. It just seemed to find everything with ease. So I was really blown away. But for both of us, the 24 megapixel on a full frame, if you have an R5 with 45 as well, it's not really what I want, but that's definitely a camera I would recommend to most people. It sits very well priced at like 2,500 US dollars amazing autofocus, amazing image quality. So I was very impressed with that camera, but I didn't get one also because I have an R3. And then I had a big Nikon year as well. They approached me and asked me if I wanted to do some reviews. And obviously that was a great opportunity trying out the Z9. The first lens I got was that amazing 600 millimeter TC lens with the built-in 1.4 extender. So I went out, I got some really cool shots with that lens. Having the ability to flick in and out that 1.4 extender was pretty amazing. So I really enjoyed that lens. Little while later, Nikon also was the second company to come out with a lens that we all want, like 180 to 600 millimeter lens. So I tried that out. Mm -hmm. That was another very nice lens. And then after that, they also had the Z8, which was a pretty amazing camera in the field that had everything we want, basically, in terms of stack sensor, amazing video abilities, great image quality. So that was an awesome camera. But the true standout for me this year was the 600 millimeter PF lens that I got to try for a little while because... 1.4 kilo, insane image quality, razor sharp images, amazing detail, literally waste nothing. Like it was the first time I felt like this could be a lens that makes me leave my big 600 millimeter lens behind. Of course, sometimes, especially want to use, when, if you want to use extenders, having a four lens helps because with a two times mm -hmm. extender, for instance, that lens is F13 with the F4 lens, we're at F8. So there is still differences, but Big just having yeah. a tiny, tiny 600 millimeter lens, I think is something that you would enjoy as well, isn't it? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then at the end of the year, also bought a new lens. You saw behind me there, the Canon turned it to 800 millimeter lens, which 
has definitely grown on me. I wasn't quite sure at the start, but now I think it's a really amazing addition because as I said earlier in this video, having the ability to just zoom to 800 millimeters without any talent converters, anything else is unheard of in the market. And in this sort of package at that price point, it's truly amazing. And I know I'll be using it a lot. Yeah, well, definitely a year with lots of gear for you, lots of fun toys to play with. Now, before we move on here, I thought we should say one thing that we're looking forward to in the new year, in 2024. And I'll let you go first, and maybe it's the same thing. Well, let's see what you say. Okay, my one thing is the R5 Mark II and the R1. <laughs> <laughs> well, I meant more... I meant more like an experience. I was going to say when I'm coming back to Australia to do some more shooting later this year. I thought that was our <laughs> little secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's definitely a good one as well. And hopefully by then we will actually have those cameras already. Yeah, maybe. That would be that would be really nice. Yeah, definitely. Okay, well, let's move on now. We have a new segment, the editing tip of the week, because as we know, Digital post-processing is so important if you're gonna get the best out of your photos. And so from now on, every episode, we're gonna give you guys a little tip, something that we both do in our post-processing regimes, and hopefully that will help you to continue to improve and improve and improve and get the absolute best out of your photos. And of course, if you want to improve right away, you can also check out my masterclass, our pro sets, Glenn's ebook, and our brush pack down there in the description that will make you a better editor and get more confidence instantly. And I think editing often sounds complicated, but it doesn't have to be complicated. So I think we're going to start with a very simple one here that a lot of people don't actually seem to be aware of. Because oftentimes you see those sliders and you just don't know to which point you should actually pull them. It could be the levels, it could be the highlights, the shadows, the blacks in Lightroom or Photoshop, for instance. And there's a very simple trick that shows you how far you can actually go with these sliders. So if you're on a PC, you can hold down the Alt key and move the sliders. And if you're on a Mac, you hold down the Option key and move the sliders. And what will happen then is that you first start with a black or completely white screen. And as you move the slider, you will start to see areas appear. And basically the perfect point or perfect position for all these sliders is right where you start to see a few things appearing. The more you, you see appearing basically means its eyes are blowing out or losing all the details. So you don't want to push it too far. But if you just pull it to the area where you see a few areas appearing, you'll get a much better photo. And specifically for the levels, there's another trick. Because sometimes you do a levels adjustment, you pull in the darks and the bright areas. And the whole image might look a little bit dark now because you put, there was a big gap on the dark side. You can then also grab the mid-tone slider in the middle and move it to the left a little bit, which then lifts the whole image without lifting the darks too much, giving you a really nice overall feel. So for example, especially with the highlights, you bring in the point, you hold down the Alt key and you start to see little areas getting blown out. Now you, you, hold, you take your finger off the Alt key and you can kind of look and see how the image looks. You might actually go back a little bit darker yeah. or you might keep it where it is. But the really important thing that I wanna say is you might still need to make the overall image brighter. Now some areas are now getting blown out and you can see right where those are. So this is where if you know how to do and use layer masking, you know those are the areas that you're gonna have to mask back to hold on to that brightness. So using the Alt key can help you to set the points, but it can also tell you where you wanna push past the point and then have to mask back. So it's a really useful tool and a really useful thing that can really help you to get um, your images looking the, the right sort of brightness. We've said many times on people's images on the photo of the week looks a little dark could be a little brighter. The overall thing needs to be brighter, but you're going to need to hold on to those, those bright areas. We've said it so many times on the photo of the week, so now you guys know what to do about it. So there we go. That's the first installment of the editing tip of the week. But I have to say, Jan, I'm not crazy about this editing tip of the week name. Maybe some of our audience has a better idea for what we should call this segment. So if you guys have any good ideas, what can we call this editing segment? Let us know there down in the description. And also let us know in the comments, what was your favorite like learning experience or moment or photo in 2023? All right, so before we move on to the photo of the week, I just want to quickly announce that the winner of the LensCoat $150 gift card from our last episode was Tibalt Develars. So you've been already contacted, I believe, and congratulations on winning the gift card. And for everyone else who didn't win, thank you so much for participating. We're going to have lots more giveaways this year with more free swag and gift cards and things like that. So stay tuned for those. And now it's time for everyone's favorite segment, the photo of the week. Okay, so for the first image that I brought for us this week, 
It's by Darren Stevens Photography. It's a beautiful little kingfisher. You know, you guys know I have a, a soft spot for these kingfishers. And maybe it's because since I'm coming to Australia later this year and I'm really hoping to maybe see this species, that's why I picked it. It's a nice image, a nice clean shot. Um, I imagine along a riverbank or something like that. Obviously it'd be nice to get it on a slightly more interesting perch or something like that, but I just thought it was a nice clean shot of this beautiful little kingfisher. Yeah, I think it looks really nice. I think looking at it, at least here on my screen, it looks like there's a bit of a blown out area on like the sort of underneath the wing on the, the side mm, above the yeah. lake. So that might be some area you could work on. And then I think it looks really good. I wonder if you could warm up this image a little bit. I feel like it has maybe a slight blue cast sort of overall and maybe that bank slightly warmed up. To the bird maybe. The bird as well. And also the bank slightly lightened yeah. up maybe could give it a slightly nicer overall feel. One of our brushes in the brush pack is warm it up. So you could easily just select the bird if you wanted to just warm it up and then paint that in there, or there's a few ways you could do yeah. it, but that would be a really easy way to just sometimes playing around with the, I had to do this a lot on the penguin images that I was editing from Antarctica, where you kind of wanted the background to stay quite cool and look, you know, icy, cool, frosty. Yeah. But if you left the bird that cool, it looked really weird and warming up the bird and keeping the background cool. So those brush packs were fantastic for that. Super easy to do it just like that. My first image of the week has to start with a little apology because in one of the previous episodes, we picked an image of this photographer, but the photo was actually stolen by one of our favorite or one of the many photo thieves on Instagram. But it's very hard for us to tell if the account looks legit and it doesn't have a funny name and it all looks like a normal photographer. There's no way for us to tell that it's not that person's photo, but thanks for people alerting us to us. So now we're actually going to use an actual photo from our photographer, Anoop. And I picked this one of the Rufus Sibia. And I think that was just a really spectacular looking bird with that awesome dark crest, the nice colors on the bird. And I think the editing overall looks really nice as well. The only thing about this image I would say is that on the back of the head, it looks a tiny bit cut out. I don't know if the background was blurred or something was cloned or the background was smoothed out a little bit. That was the only thing I would probably work on a little bit, but I think overall a fantastic looking image. We often recommend to people if something's quite distracting to try to remove it, but it does come with the caveat that it has to be done well, you know, and it has to be done that in my opinion, even that someone with as discerning of eyes and who's looked at as many photos as we have, that you cannot tell that something's Ideally, been cloned. Yes. So if, you, if you're cloning stuff, but people can tell, then it's almost better to leave it in. Um, this is a marginal one. I don't think most people would notice, no. but but yeah, it does look like maybe something at the back of the head there. And I, the only other thing I would say is, and I don't know if this was applied, it does look like there's a sort of like a vignetted effect around the yeah. image, which maybe is just by happenstance of how the background was. I'm never really a crazy fan of it being added afterwards, um, but because it does have that spotlighting effect. So maybe some people enjoy it. It's a personal preference thing but it's not my favorite thing to sort of add that around the image. Just, just what I think. But overall, great photo. All right, so for my second image this week, I've picked this shot of this really cool dipper in Switzerland by Mel Weber Photography. And I really like a lot of what's going on in this image. There's only really one thing that I actually was really hoping for. And Jan, what do you think that might be? A uh, head turn, just like I did then. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I love this setting, the water, the rocks, the ice. It's a really cool scene for this bird. It's just that the bird's kind of looking away. If only he had given us a little head turn, then I think that would have really elevated this image. But overall, still a really nice shot. I think it's nicely processed. The whites are white. The blacks are kind of look black. I think the bird looks pretty nice. What do you think about this one, Jan? I think there's a couple things. First of all, I think you could also like in the other photo, warm up the bird a little bit to maybe make it stand out a little bit more. I think this is exactly how you mentioned your penguin scenes where you want the background to be blue and mm -hmm. icy, but you don't necessarily need to have a little bit of that blue cast on the bird and maybe adding a little bit of saturation, making it a bit warmer could make it stand out a bit. And then I sort of wonder if I want this photo maybe either wider or slightly tighter cropped. I feel like mm -hmm. now it's like I'm seeing some of the rocks, but I'm not seeing more of the rock so maybe it'd be interesting to see that water kind of coming down from the rock above the bird or i could go a little bit tighter but then you kind of lose or what makes it so maybe i would have thought for this one maybe you could just go a mm. little bit wider if you go for that habitat shot maybe showing even a little bit more of the habitat but that's really a minor thing 
Yeah, and it could be it could be that if this was cropped in its sort of normal ratio, like two to three, that there is more up yeah. above, maybe. But yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting point because clearly this is a shot where you're going for the atmosphere, the habitat, and and the bird fairly small in the frame. But then the question is how small. Mm. Maybe if the bird was more engaged and more engaging, then that allows you to even make it smaller because it kind yeah. of it's stronger. But because the bird is not actually looking at you, and then you make it really small, it kind of continues to diminish the effect that you were going for. Perhaps I don't know. Just a few thoughts to think about. My next photo is from Nature Photo Stop NZ, and it's of this awesome little wattle bird and one of these cool flowers that we have down here in Australia. And I think there's a lot of things to like about this photo, especially how the bird is sort of framed by the leaves and how it sits on the flower. But then there's also a few things I would probably change. And let's see if they're the same that you would change. Yeah, I mean, I really like I really like the shot. I like the setting. I like these kinds of more natural images where the bird's perching in a cool spot and happen, happen to land somewhere good. Um, I love the pose. That's very dynamic pose, kind of with a nice um, eye contact. And of course, again, the perch and the not just the flower, but the leaves and the little like dead leaves off of the yeah. off of the stem are quite nice. I think if it was mine, I'd probably go a little brighter overall while holding onto the background. Yeah. Um, and there's a couple of things that I would work on removing in the background. Above the top of the flower, kind of going out a diagonal, there's quite a bright bit. And then there's another very vertical yeah. one that's going right through the bird's head, which is the one that really is a, a, a problem. And so, yeah, I would I would do some careful cloning and, and sort of, I would kind of bring that more green, um, modely background that's over to the left of the bird and keep coming with that over and replace that vertical spot and also the the white diagonal. And I think overall then it would just, you wouldn't have those distractions and you could really focus on the bird and its habitat. I agree, especially that tree right behind the head. You almost look past the bird onto that tree first before you sort of look back and look at the rest of the image. And I think we both agree whenever there's something like that in a photo, it probably makes sense to remove it because you want people to look at your subject, what you tried to photograph, not some random tree that was there, unfortunately. Now, you could have probably maybe moved two steps to the right in the field as well to put the tree behind the flower, but then you may have gotten something else in your background. So let's just assume this was yeah, the only one you can say. shoot on because there was a crocodile next to you or whatever. So <laughs> in this case, we would just remove it. And I think definitely brightening the bird and the tree and probably also adding a little bit of saturation to the flower would help you because at the moment, the background's almost more colorful yeah. when, than the flower. And I think that yellow flower should really yep. pop and the bird itself should pop a bit more. But Awesome photo, and I think with a little bit more editing, it could be a true standout. Probably one of the best photos of this bird if you just clean up a couple things. I think that's one of the biggest things that trips people up is they w they want to do that, but they're not quite sure how to selectively do that here, but not here. Yeah. And this is again, again, where our brush packs can really help. Sorry to be pr plugging them so much, but this is why we made them. Yeah. It's so easy in this case to just simply click one click, run the satur add saturation brush and paint it in over the flower. Boom, like that, you're done. Yeah. You don't have to add it to the background. You don't have to add it to the whole layer and then layer mask. You can simply select the right brush, paint it in, yeah. and all of a sudden your photo looks better. Because ultimately it's really about making the subject shine. Okay guys, my last photo this week is by Gaz Photo UK. You know, this is just a really nice, clearly a setup shot. Maybe it's in his backyard, you know, somewhere. These are, I, th I think these birds come to feeders and he's done a really nice job setting it up. He's set himself in a good position with a nice, pleasing background, nice kind of bit of a colorful background. And he's set up a really nice kind of perch that's interesting. He's got that second element of the perch kind of up in the top left. The bird is quite small, but because the perch is interesting, and this is one where you could leave it this wide, or you could definitely have cropped that in, like you could do a square tight crop of that, and that would be a really nice way to present yeah. this as well. Different, both good, but it's just a really nice, it's a good example of a, of a well set up image. What did, what did you think about this one, Jan? First of all, I hope that the original photo is a horizontal shot because this perch really screams that it wants to be shot horizontally. Like, I want to see more of the perch mm. on the left and then I want to see it continuing. I don't, really don't need any dead space above or below the bird. That's, as you say, a tighter, maybe square crop could have worked here. Like, the 4x5 doesn't, it helps it to mm. screen split the screen space on your phone, but that's all it does, really. It doesn't mm -hmm. actually help to present the image quite well because i think it takes away from the bird if anything and it actually makes the perch look almost 
angled, but I think that's only because of how it is cropped off. If you have that nicely horizontally, I think it would look really nice. But overall, fantastic shot. Definitely a perch I would have liked to find as well. Like that's definitely in the top notch kind of category. It's nice and small. It's really sort of yep. gnarly moss coming off it, different colors, different angles. Like that's absolutely superb. Very nice background as well. So I think a really nice image and there's not much I would change. I don't know if we would say that the tit maybe has a bit of a blue cast as well here just to warm it up slightly, but it's really nitpicking at this stage. The last photo for me is of this chestnut-breasted munia, and that's a bird I've only ever seen once here in Australia, and definitely one I want to photograph, and that should be put mm. onto our list for when we meet up in the north later this mm. year, because that's definitely one we should hopefully yeah. be able to get. And it's just a really nice looking bird, obviously quite a tight crop, but for Instagram this works actually really well, because you can appreciate all the amazing details on the bird, all the amazing colours. And there's probably not much mm -hmm. I would do to this image. The only thing I would possibly do is work on the face and sort of the mask of the bird a little bit. There's a few different things you could maybe lighten certain areas slightly with, with a curve or use something like a nick collection detail extractor, just bringing in a tiny bit more detail in the face or making the eyes stand out more. Even if you just brighten maybe the catch lights in the eye to kind of make that eye pop a little bit more. I think just looking at it, that's really the only thing about this image where I feel like it could improve a bit is just to make maybe the eye stand out a little bit more because at the moment that doesn't really stand out to me. I look at sort of everything, but there's not one point I'm looking at. And especially because it's cropped so tightly, like the eye of the bird is actually so high up in the frame that you're normally more drawn to the middle of the bird also because that's brighter. So if you mm -hmm. then work on the eye a bit, it probably helps you to look at the bird's head first and sort of appreciate it from top to bottom. <laughs> Yeah, I think because the bird, it's an interesting point, because the bird is perched so vertically, whereas I would almost think that this is an, a little bit of an abnormal pose for this bird. Yeah. They're probably usually a bit more hunched over. Um, but I think it's a great shot. I think it looks really nice, and it's got that big honk and seed eater bill, and it's got lots of cool little details in the plumage. So I think it's a really nice image. And that's a good way for us to end the show this week. So we hope you've enjoyed the show. We hope you like the new segment, the editing tip of the week perhaps soon to be renamed by one of you. We want to wish everybody a happy new year out there. And thank you so much for watching and supporting us, supporting Jan's channel, supporting the show. And we look forward to bringing you lots of hopefully entertaining shows this year. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button and we will see you guys very soon. Bye. See you next time, everybody.